Welcome to Management TV. Today, we are with Jack Welsh. He has been a business icon, the most admired CEO of the 20th century, and probably going to be the most admired CEO in the 21st century because of his revolutionary ideas. Thank you very much, Jack, for being with us today. It's great to be with you. We were talking about education, trade unions, about leadership, and you have new ideas on every subject. Why don't we start with your most uh, uh, beloved subject, the leadership? Well, I think there's been, at Wadawe, a real decline in the focus on leadership development in companies. I see it everywhere I go. Companies aren't spending the time. It's, they're, they're, they're under too much pressure the global pressures, the cost pressures, to focus enough on leadership and building players, evaluations, uh, training, all these things that are so necessary to build great organizations. I think I have a reason why that's happening. Why? It's the damn computer. People are able to communicate all the time with email, giving messages by email, receiving emails, blind copying five people, copying seven others, not face to face. It even happens in cubicles from one to the next to the next. And people don't have that gritty, gritty conversation with people. A, a raise comes in for somebody. Type it, ship it out, the raise. It's happening too often. And people aren't focusing on where are my leaders? Who are my best? Am I taking care of them? How do I build the next generation? How do I do all these things? The damn computer is depersonalizing business. You know, 30 years ago, Ann Andy Grove and I were on a panel together in, in San Francisco. And I was talking about walking around factory floors and shaking hands, meeting people, talking about it. And he said, Jack, that's the dumbest thing in the world. He said, I don't do that. I send emails. I do this. And Andy Grove was a great lead leader. He did a great job with Intel. He had a different style. He was omnipresent. We, we argued like hell that day on that panel. <laughs> and um, I think his method has won. And more and more people are doing these things using computers than they are the old-fashioned, nitty-gritty way. Now, I'm not trying to be old-fashioned about this. I'm talking about leadership development. How do you get in the skin of your people? You don't do it with emails. You get in the skin of your people by looking them right in the eye, being across from them, talking to them, uh, telling them what they're doing right, telling them what, what they need to do to improve, coaching them, all these things. You, you couldn't run, run with a football team or a soccer team with a computer. Of course. You've got to be there showing them, feeling it, sweating, doing it. In communication, they say that 80% is not the, the words you use, but rather the body language, the emotions. And obviously through email, you lose all that. And even worse, you, you get misunderstandings and you feel things that are not there that could be avoided by person to person. That's for sure in communications. But think about leadership development. You can't do it with an online program. You've got to do leadership development by, with, with your people by being with them. The two pillars of leadership development, what would those be? Uh, one would be knowing that when you're a leader, it's not about you, it's about them, your people. Always caring about how they are developing, how they are growing, how they are building, how they are encouraged to come up with ideas. That's clearly one, but there's more than, than two even. Another one is you've got to be encouraging idea flow. You've got to get your team on board to, to, with a philosophy that says, there's a better way every day. How do I find it? Let's talk about that better way. Let's look outside. Let's look at other companies. Let's look everywhere. There is a better way every, every day. And then there's this idea to engage people. Engagement is critical. Get them with a sense of purpose as to what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what's in it for them. Not what's in it for you, not what's in it for the company, what's in it for them? Is it job security? Is it promotions? Is it personal growth? What is it that communicates that to them? 
being a great leader, is that mostly in, in their DNA or you can really do something about it? Oh, it's clearly, it's partially DNA. You can't be a passive person. But on the other hand, a lot of it is learned behavior. Okay. The ability to face inner people, the ability to challenge people. That people can see, that can be put into people. Training means a lot, how to hire, how to fire, how to motivate, how to communicate. That's a trained skill. Now, you can't be a nerd hiding in a corner and get that, that's not, nothing's gonna happen. You can train them all day and they're gonna hide. But in general, it's a good mix of learning with innate born skills. Uh, when I stammered, I had this stammer, and it's much better now than it used to be. She would say, don't worry, Jack. Your tongue just can't keep up with your brilliant mind. So I was constantly being infused with self-confidence. I played sports. I was always elected captain. That gives you another shot of self-confidence. So each time you feel the self-confidence. So you're willing to try things as a leader. And some things don't work. But it's okay, I've, made all, I've probably made more mistakes in business than anybody in business, because I've tried more things. But I quickly learn from it. And the other thing I do is, which is very successful for me, is I hire smart people. I search for smart people. I love smart people. I'll go into a room going this way with an idea, and I'll come out of the room going that way with the idea after listening and wallowing for three or four hours to good, smart people. I'm willing to change. I'm open to, to change. Uh, I love to wrestle with ideas. In the end, I'll make the decision, yeah. but I'll get tons of input. You make so much emphasis on smart people. Is that the only skill you look for in no, people? No, I look for people that are self-confident, will speak up, yes. have the courage of their convictions, will be willing to, to be uh, challenged and fight back and won't wilt. Uh, some of our conversations are not, you know, very pleasant. Some people call them food fights. Mm -hmm. As we fight over an idea, we care. And uh, you've got to be able to get it back up off the floor and come back and fight. I always said to most acquisition ideas, I'd say no. And if the person on the other side of the table went, okay, and went out of the room, I never wanted to do that deal. But if the person on the other side of the table said, Jack, wait a minute, listen. Here's what I want to do. Here's why I want to buy this company. Here's why it's right. Here's what I'll do. And almost wanted to grab me by the shirt and came close to doing it sometimes. That's when I knew I wanted that person and I'd back them, I'd take a chance with them. When you were a captain of the hockey team, for example, there was one occasion where you lost and apparently you threw up your stick and uh, you were bad tempered. Uh, Stupid. What did you learn from that? Well, my mother came roaring into the locker room, I grabbed me by the shirt and said, you punk, if you don't learn how to lose, you shouldn't be playing the game. And I learned, I learned in many of my setbacks, I learned a lot of things. Uh, in this case, I learned you had to be a good loser. You had to be able to want to win like crazy, but if you lost, get on with it and do, and do the next thing. But I made acquisitions that didn't work. And I learned from the, sometimes I bought a company with a bad culture. Why'd that fail? Because I bought something without thinking of the culture. I was doing the numbers, not thinking of the culture. Uh, I hired some people that were not successful. Why were they bad? Why didn't they work out? Because I was hiring them based on their appearance and their glibness. I learned from that. When was the first time you thought, I could be the CEO of GE? Oh, I'd say in the early 70s, after I'd been there about 10 to 15 years. And then you said, I want to get there? I want to get that. And I put it on my review. Now, that was taken both ways. Some people liked it. Some people thought it was abrasive, outrageous. I was, at that time, 35, 37. Outrageous, what is, what is this guy doing? He's a punk. He could whisper these things. I wasn't enough of a diplomat. All these types of things, but he couldn't get away from my results. You have many stories of over-delivering. Um, can you share one of them? Well, 
I think the best one and the one that broke my career open was when I was a young engineer and my boss was my boss was having his boss come up from New York to review our, our projects. There were seven of us engineers in this development group. And I could have at that time shown this guy coming in, I could have shown, oh, we're making a new plastic. We're, I was working on a new plastic. I could have shown him my project with the pipes and the, and the plastic and shown him what it was doing and how the color was getting better, was brown, was getting clearer and all that. I could have given him a project report on my plastic performance. What I did was I gave him, I worked my tail off for like 10 days to study the whole plastics industry. And I gave him a view of DuPont and Dow and their chemical, well, every product they had and where we fit in the competitive landscape and why we had a future with that. The guy was blown away and he never forgot me. And two or three times I came for promotion, he pushed me forward. Because what you gotta do in a job is you've gotta always be teaching your leadership something. You gotta be always broadening their horizon so they look good for their bosses. You can't just give this little project like this, make things bigger, make them smarter than their heroes and their, their, their world. Those were the milestones on the strategic uh, point of view. In terms of leadership, you obviously had to select your team and get rid of those that were not part of right. it. How did you do that? Well, I took what was a formal appro uh, appraisal system, mm -hmm. and that was uh, three hours, uh, an hour with each group executive in one day, and turned it into an all-day session at the location of the business. Me, the human resource head, and the people in the business. And we stayed there for 10 hours at a time, pouring through every person. I made people management the key to the company's future. And they got that message because I went out there for days on end to every location. And it was a key part of changing the tone. It wasn't just a ritual that said, when you put on your appraisal, what do you want to do next? I want my boss's job and the boss put down fully qualified on a check mark and then put it in the drawer again. I wanted to spend time with each person. I wanted to shake them and feel, see what they were made of. I wanted to wallow with them on their problems. I wanted to see how they handled it. I, want, I was more interested in how they reacted to things than then in their presentations. And you know, it, it's so interesting when you think about this whole personnel thing. That's the whole key to business. You put the right team on the field and you're gonna win the game. Lights out. You're gonna win the game. You can have all the strategy in the world and you got a bunch of dopes reporting to you <laughs> with no energy. You got nothing. You gotta have a fired up, passionate team that knows where you're going, why you're going there and what's in it for them. Think of that all the time. Where you're going, how are you going to get there, and what's in it for them? It has been a, a wonderful time to have this conversation. I thank you very much for all your insight. I hope to have you back soon on Management TV. Well, I, Eduardo, I always love to, talking to you, and this is no exception. Thank you very much. And thank you for following us on Management TV. See you soon.